Despite being the first to create and deploy tanks during World War I, the British Army's armored vehicles were in a word, mediocre, by the onset of World War II. Throughout the war, it manufactured tanks that ranged from terrible, to barely adequate. Some were rushed into service too soon, and became infamous for their unreliability. Others took too long to develop, or required too many iterations to be even marginally helpful. Nearly all of them were undergunned, and most lacked the armor necessary to fend off enemy anti-tank guns. That's why, starting in 1943, British armored divisions embraced the American Sherman, a tank often outmatched by its adversaries, but valued for its reliability, adaptability, and crucially, its widespread availability. The situation demonstrated the strength of American industry and the shortcomings of British procurement. It was only in the very late stages of the war, that the British managed to develop an effective tank design, although this achievement had no impact on the overall outcome of the conflict. So, why did it take Britain a considerable amount of time to develop a tank that was genuinely efficient? The origins of failure were sown before the war, as pre-war policies of disarmament, economic retrenchment, and the inherent conservatism within the army, hindered the developments of armored forces. While there were limited trials involving the deployment of mechanized units, there was a lack of genuine commitment to fully integrate tanks into the army's organizational framework. Furthermore, clear decisions regarding doctrine, or the specific types of tanks needed, were conspicuously absent. The government prioritized home defense, allocating a significant portion of resources to the Royal Air Force, the Navy, and anti-aircraft defenses. Limited funding was allocated for the provision of equipment, to support a mechanized expeditionary force. These factors collectively exerted a profound influence, on the evolution of Britain's tank forces and their effectiveness, during the Second World War. By 1936, the army established a preference for three distinct tank types to fulfill specific tactical needs. These included light tanks for reconnaissance purposes, heavily armored infantry tanks, to provide support during frontal assaults, and fast cruisers, designed to exploit breakthroughs and engage enemy tanks. This decision would greatly complicate the design and development of British tanks. Light tanks were viewed as necessary for reconnaissance, and were effective in colonial policing, but they were not suited for the main armored army. The conservative faction within the army's ranks advocated for the infantry tank, essentially a revival of First World War principles. The looming threat of a new European conflict raised the specter of potential trench warfare, necessitating tanks capable of traversing rugged terrain, and withstanding the most formidable artillery fire. The A-12 Matilda, a significantly larger tank, was commissioned and became operational in 1938. It boasted the most formidable armor of any tank during that period, and was armed with a two-pounder gun, which was among the most potent anti-tank weapons in existence at the time. The cruiser tank concept aligned more closely with the doctrinal principles endorsed by tank specialists. The initial entries into this category were the A9 and A10, both equipped with the two-pounder gun. The 1940 campaign in France, swiftly underscored the inadequacies of Britain's tank force. Cruiser and light tanks were vulnerable, lacking the armor to withstand German anti-tank guns. The sturdier Matildas, while more effective, managed to briefly unsettle the Germans during the Anglo-French counterattack at Arras. However, these actions only postponed the inevitable, and all British tanks in France were either destroyed or left behind during the retreat. Reliability was a significant issue, 
as many tanks broke down during lengthy road marches. Above all, there was a critical requirement for enhanced protection and firepower. A fundamental challenge arose from the fact that British tanks had to adhere to the standard railway gauge width for transport, unlike tanks from Germany in other countries. British tank designs typically positioned the fighting compartment between the tracks and suspension to maintain a lower overall profile. However, this approach limited the diameter of the turret ring, consequently impacting the size of the turret and the gun that could be accommodated. Weight also posed a significant concern, as tanks needed to be light enough for overseas shipping and for deployment on standard military bridges. These combined factors made it exceptionally challenging to upgrade existing tanks or enhance those still in the design phase. The supply of tanks continued to be hampered by the artificial distinction between infantry tanks and cruisers, as well as the imposition of evolving war office demands and specifications. In December 1939, with the expectation of a war similar to the First World War, the General Staff had insisted that two-thirds of tank production should be allocated to infantry tanks. However, just a year later, following the lessons learned from the campaign in France, the focus shifted, and priority was placed on the development of cruiser tanks. Cruiser tanks were designated for equipping armored divisions or independent armored brigades, intended for mobile operations, whereas infantry tanks were organized into separate tank brigades for providing support to infantry units. This fundamental division structure remained in effect for the duration of the war. One unfortunate consequence of this division was the delay in the development of a more potent tank gun. The design for the new six-pounder gun had already been finalized, but production of the two-pounder gun could not be interrupted. Consequently, it was not until May 1942 that the six-pounder gun was finally installed in a British tank. This emphasis on quantity over quality was the primary factor driving the production of the next two cruiser tanks, which were introduced into service in 1941, even though they exhibited glaring deficiencies. Both of these tanks were in the design phase at the onset of the war, and were built around the outdated two-pounder gun. The A-15 Crusader was hastily pushed into production, without sufficient development trials or rigorous quality control measures, leading to a quick reputation for unreliability. It served as the primary British tank in the Western Desert Campaign, where the harsh conditions of sand and heat only exacerbated its mechanical issues. The war in North Africa served as a significant proving ground, where the shortcomings in British tank design, organization, and tactics were harshly revealed. There was initial success against the Italians, which was promising. However, the reign of the Queen of the Desert, embodied by the Matilda Mark II with its formidable armor, was short-lived, as it succumbed to the larger caliber anti-tank guns employed by the German Africa Corps, particularly the deadly 88mm gun. The cruiser tanks initially enjoyed success as well, swiftly advancing across the desert in pursuit of retreating Italians. However, in later engagements against the Germans, they suffered heavy losses when launching ill-fated assaults on anti-tank gun positions, without the support of infantry. The British tanks struggled to counter this threat effectively, because the two-pounder gun lacked the capability to fire a sufficiently potent high-explosive round. Attempting to fire accurately while on the move, in line with British doctrine, also proved to be an impractical endeavor, as German tanks wisely preferred to fire from stationary positions. The German tanks of that era were not markedly superior, but they featured more efficient optics and crew arrangements. Moreover, they could be upgraded more readily to maintain their effectiveness. In 1942, the Crusader tank was also eventually upgunned with the six-pounder, though at the cost of reducing the turret crew to two members. 
Nonetheless, its persisting lack of reliability remained a significant challenge. The shortcomings of the Crusader, in particular, prompted Britain to seek American tank supplies, with the M3 Grant, and later the M4 Sherman, emerging as the most potent options. Both of these tanks were armed with a versatile 75mm gun, which notably enhanced their firepower against German tanks. It also provided British crews with the capability to eliminate entrenched anti-tank guns, and other soft targets effectively. Despite the setbacks, the British military persisted in their efforts to develop a more capable tank. Notable among these endeavors were the Valentine and Churchill tanks, both of which were built on the interior and chassis framework of the experimental A-10 model. While the Valentine was known for its stability and reliability, its small size left it vulnerable to being outmatched by the latest German tanks. The Churchill tank faced a challenging development phase, requiring the resolution of various mechanical issues. Nevertheless, it ultimately evolved into one of the most abundant and adaptable British tanks during the war. Artillery development had consistently outpaced tank design in Britain, and efforts to replace the six-pounder gun had commenced in 1941. This new weapon, the 3-inch 17-pounder, emerged as one of the most effective anti-tank guns of the war, capable of penetrating the thickest armor at typical combat distances. The impressive effectiveness of the 17-pounder gun prompted the War Office to request the creation of a new tank centered around this powerful weapon. The initial concept materialized as the A-30 Challenger, essentially an elongated Cromwell tank with a bulkier turret. However, the design of the new tank had significant shortcomings. Fortunately, an alternative solution emerged. Through some clever engineering, it was determined that the 17-pounder gun could be fitted, though quite snugly, into a Sherman tank. This led to the creation of the Sherman Firefly, which stood as one of the most impactful British tank adaptations of the war. The Firefly offered a crucial boost in firepower for the armored regiments during the Northwest Europe campaign, though their numbers were never sufficient. While still based on the standard Sherman chassis, they remained vulnerable to enemy fire. However, they finally afforded British tank crews the capability to outmaneuver and outgun the German Panthers and Tigers that dominated the European battlefield. By 1944, British tank development and production had reached a more advanced stage. The Department of Tank Design had expanded its influence and expertise, finally living up to its name. The need to produce outdated designs solely to maintain numbers, had been eliminated. It was only toward the very conclusion of the war, that the British Army ultimately possessed a tank truly ready for combat, the Centurion. Six prototypes of this brand new tank were hastily dispatched to the front, with the hope of subjecting them to combat testing. After years of striving to create a battle tank with formidable armament and robust protection, the British succeeded, but by that point, the Germans had already been defeated. With the exception of the Churchill and the later cruiser tanks, the story of British tank development during the wartime period, is indeed a tale marked by challenges. It wasn't until 1944, that British industry managed to produce a tank reasonably suitable for a rapidly evolving battlefield, and even then, it struggled to match its adversaries. Indeed, tanks like the Cromwell and Comet should have been available much earlier, as the Soviet Union demonstrated with the T-34. The T-34, introduced in 1940, arguably stood as one of the finest tanks of the war. Right from the outset, it achieved that crucial equilibrium between armor, firepower, and mobility, that had long eluded British tank designers. 
The T-34 prompted the Germans to reinvigorate their somewhat inadequate tank force, and initiated a technological arms race in which Britain quickly lagged behind. British tank crews at the front line were acutely aware of this disparity, and had every reason to lament the absence of protection and firepower that characterized their wartime experience.